I'm Liz Fawbless and this is Currents. Pope Benedict remains out of public view tonight in prayerful Lenten retreat. The story shifts now to his successor and New York's Cardinal Timothy Dolan predicts it is highly possible the next Pope could come from a non-European country. Discussing next month's Cardinal's conclave to elect a new pontiff, the Cardinal said the Pope is the universal pastor of the church and a new one from Asia, Africa or the Americas is highly possible. Again, he played down the idea he could be Pope. Anything could happen, the Cardinal said, adding, I could be the next shortstop of the Yankees, too. Cardinal Dolan is the leader of the U.S. Bishops Conference and is now saying he prefers to stick with the church rule that the conclave should not start until 15 days after Benedict steps down on February 28th, putting the conclave start date around March 15th. One of the leading non-European candidates to ascend to the chair of St. Peter is Cardinal Peter Turkson of Ghana in Africa. Last night, he gave an interview to CNN and was asked if he's going to be the next pope. It's, it's possible for any, any bishop, any ordained minister in the Catholic Church, you know, to become a cardinal, uh, to become a pope for that matter. And uh, the group of cardinals who would gather in conclave, you know, would all go in there recognizing that any of them can be chosen as a pope. We're beginning to see from all of this in our young churches, mature prelates, mature churchmen who are capable of exercising leadership in the church. So the possibility that a candidate or any of the guys, any of the cardinals to be elected pope can come from the southern part of the globe mm -hmm. is very real. The CNN host then insisted the cardinal explain why women are not priests and same-sex people cannot be married in the church. We need to be true and faithful to the faith which makes the church a church. And we need to be true to being relevant in society and fulfillment of the mission of the church. So we have these two, as it were, coordinates to, you know, to you know, trace our trajectory through. We may not sacrifice one for the other. CNN press Cardinal Turkson about the clergy sex abuse scandal. He said African culture considers homosexuality taboo and that tradition helps protect African children. Cardinal Turkson is 64 years old. The Pope arrived at his decision to resign after what may have been years of prayer and contemplation. Now a leading cardinal in Rome tells us both Popes John Paul II and Paul VI also consider the possibility of stepping down. If we took a look at his predecessors, they also considered leaving office. Paul VI thought about it and even created a commission of canon law experts to study the possibility. They advised him not to because they thought a resignation could have a psychological effect on his successor and vice versa. John Paul II also thought about stepping down, but he was advised not to and he didn't. When Pope Benedict leaves the papacy, he'll receive a pension, so says several Italian news organizations. Using a pope's pension as a guide, the reports claim the pope would receive about $3,500 a month. The Vatican has no comment other than to say the pope's needs will be met. With much of the attention of the world focused on news from the Vatican, there is a dangerous escalation of tensions between the globe's two superpowers to report tonight. The communist Chinese army has launched massive cyber attacks against the U.S. government and American corporations. Pentagon policy set two years ago considers such assaults potential acts of war requiring a military response. The ominous details of the secret Chinese military raids are now revealed. It's a dreary-looking 12-story office building in Shanghai. But according to a new report, it houses part of a shadowy Chinese military unit responsible for thousands of hacks into American businesses and government agencies. The report from the cybersecurity firm Mandiant says the group goes by discrete code names like Unit 61398, is nicknamed the Comment Crew, and is a secret division of the Chinese military sanctioned at the top levels of the government. What are they stealing? That's a great question, and it actually sort of depends on industry. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's hard to eliminate anything. It's Word documents, PowerPoint documents, email, PDF documents, Excel spreadsheets. It gets more ominous. Mandian CEO Kevin Mandia says Chinese hackers in general, he wouldn't say this specific unit, have targeted vital American services. We got more specific information. Cybersecurity researchers say that Chinese military unit also trains its attacks on infrastructure in North America, 
electrical grids and switchers like this one, oil and gas facilities, water treatment plants. One prominent cybersecurity researcher told us that last September, a company that designed software giving oil and gas companies and power grid operators access to things like valves and switches was successfully hacked by that military unit. That firm, Telvent, says it's working with its customers and law enforcement. Mandia says even though information may have been hacked on utilities, none of them have been actually disabled. Mandia says the typical hack from this unit starts with so-called spear phishing, an email sent to a company official in the U.S., masquerading itself as being from someone familiar. The victim opens an attachment or zip file and their computer is infected. Mandia says his firms tracked this military unit's hacking for six years. How? He says Mandiant would monitor the infected computers of victims who've hired his firm and go back click by click, one keystroke at a time. We saw somebody log in to the victim network here in the United States and then start checking their Gmail account. Well, it's in plain view. We're capturing the traffic. Law enforcement would call this a wiretap. We just call it full content monitoring. The Chinese government has blacked out some of CNN's reporting on this story, even as it emphatically denies sanctioning hacking. Making baseless accusations based on premature analysis is irresponsible and unprofessional, and it doesn't help solving relevant issues. China resolutely opposes to any form of hacking activities. Tonight, the White House is threatening to get tough with China, perhaps issuing a fine or cutting back on trade. Meantime, the secret military headquarters of the Chinese cyber war shown in the previous report is located in Shanghai. A television news crew yesterday attempted to record video of the building Here's what happened next. I'm gonna chase after us just yet. It's all right. Keep going. Test, test, test. Come on. Keep driving. Drive away. 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 The soldiers stopped the car, see some of the video, and ordered the crew to leave the area. Up next, the vice president's shotgun advice and a massive rally for marriage. Details as Currents continues after the break. Welcome back. Protecting and promoting the culture of life is among the most prominent roles for the Catholic Church in America. Now, Cardinal Dolan, the president of the U.S. Conference of Bishops, is saying President Obama's proposals for new gun controls are sensible and contribute to protecting and defending human life. The Cardinal says he's praying during Lent for congressional passage of those proposals. Vice President Biden, meantime, is offering his advice on guns, telling readers of Parents Magazine which weapon he thinks is best. For security at home. If you want to protect yourself, get a double barrel shotgun, have the shells of 12 gauge shotgun, and I promise you, as I told my wife, we live in an area that's wooded and somewhat secluded. I said, Jill, if there's ever a problem, just walk out on the balcony here or walk out, put that double barrel shotgun and fire two blasts outside the house. Mr. Biden says he learned about guns from his father, who was a hunter. While Cardinal Dolan agrees with the president on guns, he's strongly opposed to the abortion mandate contained inside the Obamacare health law. And he's spoken out powerfully against New York Governor Andrew Cuomo's push to force a radical, unrestricted abortion law upon all New Yorkers. Now we know most citizens of the state agree with the cardinal and oppose the Cuomo abortion law. Earlier today, I was with Greg Funstein, the leader of a pro-life foundation. He just completed completed a survey of New Yorker's state of mind on life and about abortion, I asked him what he found. There's general support for, bra for uh, restrictions on abortion, uh, things like pro-notification, waiting periods, informed consent, things that are being passed in the states. And there's uh, a lot of opposition to expanding access to abortion uh, in New York State. Uh, this is not a popular bill. There's not a, uh, a constituency that's clamoring for this, except possibly uh, abortionists. Uh, you'll have a lot of people saying, you know, all right, a survey's a survey, a poll's a poll. Now that we have these results, what's next for the foundation? Where do we go from here? Back to City Hall with these results? Yeah, I mean, we're continuing to work to educate uh, lawmakers and citizens about this issue, make sure our voters are aware of what's going on with this law. 
Uh, we've been trying to make it clear that uh, at least the legislation that's been introduced, the Reproductive Health Act, is not, as Governor Cuomo continues to say, uh, a codification of federal law. Federal law allows for all kinds of restrictions on abortion. This law would essentially outlaw any, any possible restriction that could ever be passed in New York State. Uh, this is not a codification of, of New York law. This is a vast expansion of abortion in the state, and it should very much be stopped. So we're going to continue to try and educate legislators and the public uh, through any means that we can. There's a fair body of uh, social science research that indicates that restrictions on abortion decrease the number of abortions. Mm -hmm. So uh, in, in a situation in which it's, it's not politically possible for us to ban abortion completely, uh, you know, working toward fewer abortions is something that we think is worthwhile. Uh, so things like uh, parental notification for minors to receive abortions, waiting periods, uh, ending, um, ending Medicaid funding for abortion, which happens mm -hmm. here in New York State, uh, you know, any kind of informed consent, all of these things have been shown in other states to decrease the number of abortions. And there's broad support for these things in New York. Uh, the, the waiting period is perhaps the most surprising because that's a law that's difficult to pass virtually anywhere. Uh, but even, even here in New York, majorities of voters, uh, even including pro-choice voters and Democrat voters, uh, they support a waiting period, 24-hour waiting period for mm -hmm. women before they get an abortion. New Yorkers take abortion seriously. They don't think it's something to be taken lightly. That's something that we found in our poll. Um, they think that it should be taken, it should be something that happens as a last resort in rare cases uh, mm -hmm. and that it should be restricted. And, and Governor Cuomo's effort moves in exactly the opposite direction. And really quickly, Greg, I, I want to wrap up, but I just kind of want to wrap around to something that you said prior to this answer. New Yorkers take abortion very seriously. Do you find or did you find that New Yorkers are uh, also extremely proactive with regard to voicing their opinions, taking a stand, writing their senators and, and writing anybody that could enact any change to put an end to abortion? Or are they kind of just more like, all right, here's our opinion we'll let our leaders take yeah. the fore on that. Unfortunately, I think that the uh, the other side, the folks at NARAL and Planned Parenthood are much better at getting their, their base mobilized. Mm -hmm. But again, they only represent a small portion of the population. Maybe 20% of the population really agrees with Planned Parenthood and NARAL. Uh, in, in being in favor of you know abortion on demand without apology, we need to work uh, with our base, which is which is uh, equally as large, uh, that holds to the Catholic position, and even larger that thinks abortion should be very rare. We need to motivate those people to get involved and to take positions. And even if they consider themselves pro-choice, mm -hmm. they should think about the fact that this you can be pro-choice and and be against this bill. This is beyond you know allowing abortion for that rare case when when someone you know needs it, as they would say, which is why they consider themselves pro-choice. This is something that pro-choice New Yorkers and pro-life New Yorkers can agree on. This is too much. Greg's group has a website, nyc41percent.com, with more information and alternatives to slaughtering the unborn. One of the most important pillars to the culture of life is the family, grown from the marriage of a man and a woman. As we've reported repeatedly, the institution is under attack around the world. But in Puerto Rico, nearly a quarter million people took to the streets yesterday to stand up for traditional marriage and defend the church. Before dawn, thousands began to gather in front of the Capitol building in San Juan. The Puerto Rican legislature is considering a law giving new rights to same-sex couples. Marchers worry the law will discriminate against the Catholic Church and force public schools to teach behaviors parents don't think are correct. The island's governor says he does not support same-sex marriage. Another matter where the priorities of the church and the interests of the state intersect is comprehensive immigration reform. America's Catholic Church has led the fight for the rights of the undocumented in our land. Now, a leading Catholic educator has an idea, another intersection where the needs of immigrants and the season of Lent meet. Yeah, I think it's a wonderful idea to think about this during Lent. So often when we, when we come into Lent, we. Uh, we think about giving something up. I don't mean that we shouldn't sacrifice, but uh, it would be very helpful to think about what we're giving up for, to whom we're making this offering. You know the way young people talk about giving something back, but to whom <laughs> are you giving it back? And focusing on the subject of immigration is a very useful way of concentrating our thoughts about that. Maybe uh, the people we should be giving to are the immigrants among us. Immigration, however, is not a debate only in America. On the other side of the world, a government's plan to increase immigration in order to boost population is running into opposition, as we learn now. Let's hear some noise, Singaporeans. A rare public protest in Singapore. What rubbish is this? Singaporeans outraged over government proposals to allow the number of immigrants to rise as much as 30 percent over the next decade and a half, largely in the name of economic growth. This strategy 
of depending on foreign workers coming in uh, is not the correct strategy. These protesters say it's not a fear of foreigners, but a fear of losing jobs, a fear of overcrowding, and the fear that Singaporeans will become a minority in their own country. But the government says Singaporeans aren't having enough babies to grow the economy and stay ahead of other Asian cities. The high cost of living is one of the main reasons couples say they aren't having babies. Financially, we need to be stable. We need to feel safe before we uh, have such commitments and such obligations. Yeah, so we prefer to accumulate our wealth, earn more money first before we start to have more family planning. This government-supported group urges couples not to wait too long to try to have children. We are really suffering from a lack of children in Singapore and we want young couples to really think about uh, desiring you know, to have children and to understand that children really do bring a lot of joy to their life. New financial incentives are being offered to boost the baby making, but critics call this a warm over of a formula that hasn't worked. Ang Miao Kim is expecting her second child and says two is the financial limit. A lot of my generation, I've heard they wanted like maybe one or two. Some don't want it because it's a different lifestyle. They don't really want to have children. It's become a freer society. It's become more experimental. Women are change, have changed considerably compared to the older generation. And the value placed on having a child has completely changed. Singaporeans may not want to fill their ranks with foreigners, but convincing them to have more babies will be an uphill climb. Liz Nisla, CNN, Singapore. Up next, the hurdles of the hurricane remain. We'll have the details as Currents continues after the break. Terrible news tonight from Tanzania. A Catholic priest has been gunned down as he was about to celebrate Mass. Father Evaristus Mushi previously served in Florida Diocese of St. Petersburg before his assignment in Africa. He's the latest victim of violence against Catholic priests in Tanzania. Earlier this month, a priest was beheaded. Catholics comprise a tiny portion of the country's population. Most of the people are Muslims. Support for international religious freedom by members of the U.S. Congress is being graded tonight. The Van Institute in Utah is releasing a scorecard of congressional votes on key religious freedom le legislation. Only 19 members received A grades out of 535 who are in Congress. The best grade in New York and New Jersey, a B plus. Not many high grades tonight for the banks and insurers who are supposed to be helping our neighbors recover from Hurricane Sandy. As we learn now in this report, people are being pushed to the edge. When am I going to get my money? Begging for money is not something Catherine Hall ever thought she would have to do. I had to run to the bank two Fridays ago and beg them to give me a loan just so that I could pay my contractor. And once he's finished doing this segment of the work, we have to stop because we don't have any more money. Nearly four months since Superstorm Sandy destroyed her home in Island Park, New York, Hall has been calling her mortgage banker almost every day. She's begging them to release insurance money so she and her family can rebuild and go home. We have a, um, a four-year-old little boy who um, basically we spent his college fund. You know, the money that we've put by since his birth towards being able to send him to college later in life is what we've spent. We've sp it's gone. Hall, who is originally from Britain, and her husband Bob and four-year-old son Nathan have been living in a hotel since November. The Halls are among more than 6,000 families still waiting for insurance money. New York's governor blamed unnecessary red tape and accused banks of failing to release more than $200 million worth of insurance. The problem is some lenders require proof the repair has been made before they will reimburse for the cost of that repair. There's a lot of older people here that, you know, um, that just don't have any money. And they're being told that, um, you know, do 30% of the work and then they'll get 30% of the money. Do 50% of the work, you'll get 50% of the money. And the reason that they do that, I think, is that they're scared that you're going to get the check and leave and leave them with a property that's not sellable. You know, but we've invested a lot of money in this house you know, and it's our home. Banks contacted by CNN, including Wells Fargo, JP Morgan, Citibank, and Bank of America, tell CNN they've distributed more than 75% of all insurance money. The Hall's mortgage lender, who they asked we not name, did not respond. You know, we came here to live the American dream, and, and now we're living the American nightmare, because 
they're holding our money and we can't get it. And it's not fair, you know, it's not fair on anyone. And everybody is in the same position, everybody. I don't, like I said to you, I don't know a single person who's had a dime. And the waiting and uncertainty is taking a toll, as devastating as the storm itself. New Jersey's top officials at the Department of Banking today are meeting with residents to hear their complaints and demand action from the banks and the insurance companies. Up next, St. Anthony visits Queens, and we are there as Currents continues after the break. Finally tonight, the beloved St. Anthony of Padua draws about 5 million pilgrims every year to his shrine in Italy. As we learn now, the faithful in our diocese had the opportunity to visit with the saint and pray over his relics without making the journey overseas. We are today in the St. Adalbert Church in Elmhurst, Queens and we had uh, the starting of uh, the visit of uh, St. Anthony's relics uh, in uh, uh, the state of New York. The conventional friars have always had the remains of St. Anthony of Padua in Padua, and so the conventional friars always had a great devotion to St. Anthony. Today is the 750th anniversary of the day that St. Bonaventure found the relic of the tongue of St. Anthony when they opened up his tomb. He's one saint I feel very close with. I feel like when I pray to him, uh, he responds. The Basilica of St. Anthony have generally about 5 million people coming every year to the shrine of St. Anthony in Padua. It's something that I had seen when I was over there, and now that it's in New York, so I would like to come again and pray. But of course not all the people around the world can come to the Basilica, so on the occasion of 750th anniversary of the finding of uh, the relics, we decided to come and uh, you know, visit the people here in the New York area. St. Anthony is a set uh, back home from Haiti that uh, everybody adore, everybody pray, and he did a lot of miracles for people. So that was one of the things that makes you that I come to see the relics. As you could see from the crowd of people that came here, they came from all over because of their love for St. Anthony. And hopefully uh, he will have a continued influence on their lives to draw them closer not only to God, but also to one another. His preaching and his nonstop preaching to love of Jesus, that's what attracted me to St. Anthony. I'm looking for healing. I have a neurological condition that's getting worse day by day. And since he was a saint of miracles, I come to him with that hope. A saint who died 800 years ago has so many devotees around the world. And so very often when they come to the Basilica, we fry and ask them, but why, why are you so, I mean, connected with St. Anthony? And they always say, whenever we ask a favor, from him, it always answers because uh, we think he loves us. I came because my son-in-law was in a horrific car accident Memorial Day weekend, traumatic brain injury, and I came to bring the picture to St. Anthony and ask for God's grace is that we can heal him. What was very um, noticeable was that after the Mass, as people queued to be in front of the relic and pray before it, there was a very reverential spirit and a very quiet spirit. Thank you for joining us tonight. We leave you with the just released English anthem for this summer's World Youth Day. And remember to stay with us for the latest breaking news on the papacy. For all of us here at Currents, I'm Liz Fobles. Have a good night. Lives are changed, we're not the same, a new creation.